Hey, it's Mike here, and today the starch runner hypothesis, which really is my answer to the mounting data about starch helping build our brain as well as just the lesser known pretty incredible ability of humans to be endurance athletes. And so we're gonna look at the new research that just came out a week ago, which prompted me making this video, as well as how persistence hunting stacks up against this. And we're also gonna look at some spatial scenarios for the starch runner hypothesis, compare different hypothetical tribes, etc. So let's just go for a run back in time. <laughs> A lot of people are just not aware of how incredible of endurance runners humans are. The current 24 hour distance record is sitting at just under 200 miles, which is actually insane. You know, when was the last time you ran one tenth of that? And we have seen tribes like the Tara Umara or Raramuri, butchering that, but that's what they want to be called, running insane distances. They can run 435 miles, 16 times further than a marathon, in just over two days. And I've been thinking about this a lot ever since I read Born to Run years back, and in that book they do present the idea of persistence hunting, but they don't make a massive scientific argument there for it. They just essentially say that with humans being such good runners and their ability to sweat and run on two legs and be efficient, they can run down a lot of these larger animals, and that could be how we gained the ability to run as well in the first place. You know, we're sweating under the hot African sun and these other animals aren't cooling as efficiently and we can just chase them down and then eventually just bash them over the head with a rock. You get the idea, but this has been met with a lot of debate and criticism directly in the literature with these researchers saying that, you know, endurance running might have contributed minimally, if at all. And one of the criticisms is that, well, we often imagine this open, hot savanna. We actually evolved in what appears to be more of a forest savanna mosaic, so a mix of these two which would make it a lot harder to just chase these animals as they can you know, get into the shade again and rest and we can lose track of them. And so much for that sweating advantage. And speaking of sweating, while humans are more efficient at cooling with sweating, many animals actually sweat a bit, these prey ones, and they also cool down through panting, but our sweating requires a lot of water, which we were not advanced enough to be carrying with pouches or little bottles when we first started getting that brain growth. Additionally, cases of documented like tribal persistent hunting have been wrought with fraud or really like soft cheating, like giving the hunters water bottles or in one case, letting them hitch a ride for the section of the hunt on a Jeep. You gotta do anything for that money shot in the film industry. And it is the case that having heard this narrative, a bunch of ultra marathoners have been trying to persistent hunt various animals without success. For example, one ultra marathoner trying for five years to hunt down an antelope, but just failing year after year after year. Uh, but that's just one guy. Well, a whole team of 10 ultra marathoners tried to run down an antelope in the plains of New Mexico, which would obviously be hot. It'd be that perfect scenario. Uh, but yeah, they totally failed. They like, ran up a hill and lost them. And like, we'll get them next time. Well, it's been years since the article was published. They've clearly failed. There's also this idea that because we're bipedal, we're walking on two legs that were super efficient and that should help us chase down all these four-legged mammals but a study has come out since, you know, Born to Run, etc., showing that humans just fall within the range of normal for their movement efficiency. It's understandable why we got this idea. Chimps are just really inefficient walkers, probably because they're really meant to be swinging around trees, etc. And then we just got to think in terms of efficiency, Look at this antelope, literally gliding in the air. Uh, clearly it's efficient. So the question becomes, is there any other force that would have encouraged us to get this good at running? And that brings me to my starch runner hypothesis. There's mounting evidence in the literature that starch played a huge role in our brain growth and development. And we're gonna cover that argument in detail in a little bit. But just in terms of this hypothesis, we have potentially these large troves of starchy organs. Our early human ancestors who did not have weapons to defend themselves would need to get to these caloric troves of starch in the heat of the day when their nocturnal African predators were sleeping. So any given day from sunup to sundown, the more miles we can go, the more range we can cover, 
the more potential starch calorie brain fueling resources we have access to. And I mapped this out in a few scenarios of human ability or human ancestor ability for running, really giving these radius circles of, okay, maybe you can only run 10, maybe you can run 25, or maybe you can do 50 and back in a day. And just to get some math out of it, we can assume that there is a starch calorie density of 10,000 calories per square mile. And looking at that 10 mile radius of really 314 square miles, that gives us over 3 million calories of starch, but the 25 mile radius is nearly 2000 square miles with almost 20 million calories of starch. And then finally we have that 50 mile radius, nearly 8,000 square miles with nearly 80 million calories of starch. The further you can run, the more calories you can get. And while you're not running after an animal to kill it, you're still really running from the predators at night in this scenario, which over time could give more pressure for us to be able to run further. And of course, just getting more calories could be a self-reinforcing sort of cycle where you can run more and get more calories and then those offspring survive and then the ones that run further do as well again. And so in terms of tribes, we have a situation where you can just have a fully roving nomadic tribe that is able to cover more distance as a tribe, get those starch organs, which are often roots and tubers, or you can just have a home base and then it's how far you can get from there, like in that chart. And then it's about scouting and finding these starchy resources. So, and carrying back those starchy resources is something that a pretty recent 2023 study mentioned specifically. And we'll cover that because it's about fermenting starch fueling the brain, which is really interesting as well. So the point is to trot from plot to plot of starch. Yes, I will keep it lame. And then I would just imagine two tribes here. We have tribe A, who maybe can only do that 25 mile range. And then we have tribe B that can do the full 50. I would definitely bet on the survival and continuation of tribe B over tribe A any day. And now there's just a couple things I need to mention about just the efficacy of starch versus meat as the fuel for our brain as it grew. And I will say, I do believe that meat played a caloric role. I also believe that cannibalism likely did, but there's also, you know, berries and nuts and things that I don't think made or broke our brain growth here and the argument for me largely comes from this study here, which looked at the amount of bones at these human sites and found that when they actually adjusted for sampling where people are just digging up the popular sites with the bones, there doesn't appear to be an increased level of carnivory over time. As they say, it's really more or less flatlining, which doesn't explain some massive growth. And then also just the idea that like, Lions aren't the ones that went to space. Yet through fire, as we'll speak about, we appear to have accessed a unique calorie source known as starch, and our brain literally is fueled by glucose, which is chains of starch. As Karen Hardy and her team mentioned, these chains of glucose were perfect brain fuel for the growing human brain throughout history. And the brain's demand for glucose is large. We're talking about 150,000 calories per year for an adult. And you could do that with like two potatoes worth of starch per day, which really does add up to like 500, 600 potatoes a year, which sounds like a lot, but then you gotta think, okay, what if I'm trying to get that same amount of calories from animals? Well, now I gotta get 500 pounds of wild rabbit or three to 400 pounds of wild boar, which can gore me when the uh, storage organs, these starchy roots are not running away. And all these keto people who are eating 85% fat constantly ignore that all this wild game is super lean and super high protein and low fat. But even if you were to rely on animal fat to fuel our brain, as I recently responded to what I've learned this video uh, from this study, we're throwing away a third of those calories as they are turned into glucose through gluconeogenesis. And that of course it would be evolutionary suicide to elect to not eat carbohydrates and keep carbohydrate percentage down to like 5% of total calories nonsense. So we would not be in ketosis and we would not be using animal fat to create ketones and fuel us. Clearly glucose is the winner here. And a lot of this is about consistency. Animal populations can boom and bust, yet these starchy producing plants are primary producers. They're getting their energy directly from the sun and growing like that. They're not animals that are depending on primary producers which would be affected more by drought and instability. Which brings me to this Richard Wrangham quote from Harvard speaking on starch. Quote, its availability is much more predictable across the annual season for tropical hunter gatherers. You can also store starch much more safely than a rotting animal. And we have to be thinking about our not 
as advanced ancestors back to one to two million years ago and what they would have done and known what to do and them getting sick and dying would of course decrease their chance of survival. And speaking of Richard Wrangham who wrote Catching Fire, we gotta think how does fire fit into this? Because obviously you can cook starchy organs in order to get more, it's weird that they call them organs, in order to get more fuel. And we have, you know, some estimates that we could have had fire between 1.7 and 2 million years ago, but the evidence is much more solid for around 1 million years ago currently. So where does this add up in terms of brain growth over time? Well, we can look to this chart. And yeah, about 2 million years ago, we started seeing this steady incline in brain size. A million years ago, it seems to get even more dramatic until today where it dipped down a little bit. But some are saying that could be due to the increased efficiency of our brains. How how long have we been eating cooked starch, for example? Well, we have direct evidence of cooked starchy rhizomes 170,000 years ago. You know, we've been homo sapiens for 200, maybe 300,000 years. And a relatively recent study that I covered found that we have starch associated bacteria in the mouths of prehumans from 600,000 years ago. These are specific strains of Streptococcus bacteria that adapt to feed off our starch digesting enzymes known as amylase. And back to that Harvard article, quote, the genetic machinery the bacteria uses to do this is only active when starch is part of the regular diet. And no, it is not present in chimps and orangutans that don't rely on a starch heavy diet. But to majorly add to the argument, just about a week ago, this study came out in the journal Science saying that, hey, it appears that we have had starch adaptation genes for 800,000 years or more. These are genes that produce that salivary amylase to digest that starch, and it appears that different members of the family tree all have it, and they converged about 800,000 years ago. So probably further back than that, we got these genes. One anthropologist professor summarized these findings as from CNN, quote, the study provided compelling evidence of how the molecular machinery for converting difficult to digest starches into easily accessible sugars evolved in humans, and that this new research bolsters the emerging theory that it was carbs rather than proteins that provided the energy bump necessary for the increase in brain size over time. And we often ignore signs in plain sight of just how starch dependent we are for First of all, the majority of calories consumed by humans today are from starch. And then evolutionarily as well, we domesticated dogs say 30,000 years ago. Well, guess what? They also adapted those starch enzymes in their saliva. So they became more adapted to starch eating as opposed to more adapted to meat eating. And we also have to ask, you know, what are the Taromara eating? Taromara are primarily vegetarians. They primarily eat corn and beans. Who are those super runners, which could very well be the intersection here, one modern answer. And that is, yes, from the study of the traditional Tarahumara people were starch based in particular, getting 97% of their calories from plants, which is wild. And in this case, the starch is able to fuel their long runs. And they're also doing things like chia seed concoctions in order to keep going. So I think the fact that the best endurance running tribe on the planet is not meat based, they're not surviving off animal fat and animal protein and fueling the runs that way. No, starch is the one that's actually keeping them going as a culture. And the final thing I wanna cover here is the external fermentation hypothesis, which was that 2023 study. And this is really interesting because I think it could potentially push back the starch timeline all the way to the 2 million years where our brain started growing. One of the main points that the researchers make is that Again, this ancestor two million years ago would not have been super smart. I mean, maybe not much more smart than a chimpanzee. And yet, in this case, they would be able to go and get these starchy organs and perhaps store them in a cache where they would over time, especially in a warm environment, start fermenting into something. I didn't see them mention this in the study, but something similar to modern day traditional fermented cassava dishes, for example, puba in Brazil, hopefully I didn't butcher that, but we're talking about Homo habilis two million years ago, starting to walk upright, just perhaps grabbing some random tubers and just bringing them back over by where they sleep. And then they start fermenting a bit. And then what happens is the fuel in that starch becomes much more available. So in that sense, it's very similar to cooking starch in terms of the benefit. And as they say, quote, unlike other proposed dietary modifications, a transition to eating fermented foods does not require great leaps in cognitive ability. It does not require advanced planning as hunting, particularly hunting in groups would. It does not require the acquisition of a difficult technology as in fire or cooking. And then that could have further been boosted around 1 million years ago when Homo erectus showed up and perhaps tamed fire. 
and was able to then cook these starchy organs, making them even easier to eat. And then we had that even more rapid brain growth. And another fascinating point that they make is that through fermentation, we can actually free up some energy from fiber that we would otherwise not be able to free up. So we're like boosting the calories doubly. And then I would also add that the human gut microbiome does incredibly well on whole starches. I know a lot of people are probably thinking like, refined starch, bad, blah, blah, blah. But we're talking about history in nature where we weren't using mills and stuff to refine starch. We're talking about having all of that pith and the skin and the fiber there. And that is great for our gut. We create these short chain fatty acids from that, which are super good at preventing disease. However, when we shift to an animal based diet, we can see a negative impact within just 24 hours as this study found. So the evidence in that way is also pointing to starch. In the end, while I think persistence hunting was probably romantic for people that eat a lot of meat and wanna feel powerful and also like to run and people that read Born to Run and were like, I'm gonna go and try and catch an antelope and just failing five years in a row. But persistent hunting plus meat as a unique factor for our brain growth really doesn't add up, especially with that seemingly flat lined meat consumption over time from the bone evidence, as well as how our brain literally runs on glucose, which we're not gonna be getting from meat. So I'm proposing instead through the starch runner hypothesis that perhaps we were trotting around, jogging around, or even just walking quite fast for extended periods of time between these massive troves of starch, which again gives the perfect fuel to grow our brain, doesn't run away, doesn't gore you, doesn't have a ton of pathogens on it from raw dead meat. So in the end, well, the starch runner hypothesis probably still needs some work. It's just an idea I thought of a few years ago and mentioned it in passing in a video, but would really like to hear it even tried to be chewed apart by people, what's wrong with it, and hopefully presenting some actual arguments, maybe even data, studies, etc. So yeah, let me know in the comments down below what you think about all this. If you have any ideas to add as well, I would love to hear them, especially anybody in the field. Uh, and of course, feel free to like, subscribe, all that good stuff, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.